Good morning and welcome to the Lawyer Assistance Program Oversight Committee meeting of the State Bar. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, Michelle, can you please take the roll? Yes. Heather Benson? Here. James Hiding? Here. Tracy Lesage? Here. Deirdre Wynn? Bill Spiegel? Here. Martin Williams? Here. Whoops. We heard you. Yeah, here. Elise Yenny? Here. Justin De La Cruz? Here. All right, that's everybody and we have a quorum. That's everybody except minus one and we do have a quorum. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is call for public comment. State Bar staff will attempt to call members of the public first in the order that they signed up to provide public comment. And if no one signed up, then in the order that they appear in the attendee pool. Well, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. For those who are participating by Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It is a hand icon and should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to address the committee, please click on the hand icon now and State Bar staff will call on you in the order that hands are raised. For those who are participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That is the star key, then number nine. Again, doing so will alert staff that you'd like to make a comment and State Bar staff will call on you and open your microphone so that you can address the committee. Due to time restrictions, we cannot allow more than three minutes for each speaker. Please note that staff will have an on-screen countdown timer visible to all attendees during the duration of your public comment. The timer's three-minute countdown will, will begin as soon as you start your comment, and you will be verbally alerted once you have 30 seconds remaining. The on-screen timer will flash throughout the final 10 seconds. Um, Gina, will you please identify any members of the public who wish to speak? At this point, Mr. Chairman, there, there does not the if no public they did not there are no hands raised, and there are no members of the public who have indicated they would like to give public comment. Okay, thank you very much. So the next item on the agenda is the chair's report. Um, and I have two items. One is I wanted to thank and preliminarily thank uh, the members of the subcommittees uh, for the benchmarks and the financial assistance uh, working committee. So for benchmarks, that's Heather Benton and Dr. Elise Yenny. And for the financial assistance uh, committee, that's Tracy Lesage, Jim Hiding, and so thanks so much for your extra work. I know it was more than the quarterly um, quarterly meetings that we initially committed to, but it's important work and it's um, it was vital. And, and we have some great recommendations that I look forward to hearing and, and discussing later. Uh, the second item is I would like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Martin Williams for his service, uh, not only to the committee, but to the lawyer assistance program as a whole. It is my understanding that this is Dr. Williams' last meeting with us as a committee member. Um, and I just wanted to um, discuss that Dr. Williams has served in nearly every role, uh, non-staff role with the lawyer assistance program. So in, in addition to being a committee member, he served as an evaluation committee member and a group facilitator. So this committee will certainly miss Dr. Williams' experience and sage advice. And so thank you very much, Dr. Williams, for your commitment to serving the committee, uh, the state bar and the state of California. And at this time, I'd like to invite any other committee members to, to make any remarks um, and thank Dr. Williams. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed serving. Thanks so much and we'll, we'll certainly you. miss you. Thank you for your service. Okay. Next on the agenda is a staff report. Uh, this item is being uh, presented by Captain Hongiri, uh, Michelle Harmon, and Bridget Graham. Great. Who do you want to start, Michelle? You can go ahead. Okay, great. 
Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. So I wanted to give the update for the lab support side today. And I'm really happy to announce that we have hired a new senior program analyst. His name is Ken Norris. And he's coming, he came to us from the McGeorge School of Law and Career stu Student and Career Services, excuse me. Um, he is a graduate of Northeastern University and he's admitted to practice in both Massachusetts and Maine. So he's currently very busy working on the expansion side of the lab support services and we're really excited to have that, him. Um, and he's in the audience, so just everybody say hi to Ken. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I wanted to also give an update on the competency presentations. Lita's unable to join us today, but as of today, she has conducted 76 presentations. 13 of those were in person, um, and six of those were hosted as the state bar, as the MCLE provider. Um, we do have three pending presentations for the rest of 2023, and we already have uh, 14 scheduled for 2024. So we already have an exciting year coming up and we're starting on um, doing the prevention and detection competency credit. And we'll also be offering the wellness competency credit um, as the state bar board of trustees did uh, expand the competency credit to two hours. So that's my update. And if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> well, hearing none, I'll turn it over to Bridget. And if any questions come up, um, I'll be here um, to answer them as well. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Um, so I just wanted to give you all an update about the sale of the San Francisco building at the, the State Bar. Um, I think we last time we were talking, I was telling you and, and mentioning that in our in our fee bill, the, the legislature gave the board or the bar um, authority to use the reserves from the lap funds if if we needed to and the good news is we have officially sold the building now so that we will although we do have the statutory authority we will not need it we will not be using that and will not be using the lap reserves because the building actually sold so i just wanted to give you that happy update um and that's really all if anyone has questions about it i'm happy to answer i'm curious jim hiding i'm curious about uh, how much it sold for you know, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I think it's been in some news reports we can find out for you. All right. Any other questions? We really appreciate the fact that the uh, state bar isn't going to require any distribution of our funds. I think that I, I know personally, I felt like, um, I needed a little more notice of that intention. I would like to have been able to demonstrate my displeasure with it to the legislators and uh, to make my own opinions known and actually to inquire about it. Maybe my opinions were wrong and I needed to be a little educated on it, but I, but I didn't get that opportunity. Uh, so I found out about it as, well, here's your fee bill and guess what it does. <laughs> and I, I, I thought that was a little bit rude on the part of the board of trustees, and uh, and not uh, they didn't consider our input at least not mine. <laughs> I didn't hear of anybody else's. So, so uh, for whatever that's worth, I, I really appreciate the fact that they're not going to dip into our reserve. So, thank you. I will just in response to that, I, I know we had some issues with our the, the, mo the meeting that was the last meeting, so we could have had a better discussion. So that was part of it. And and as I'm sure you know, with things in the legislature, some things happen very quickly. And this was one of those situations. It certainly was not a, um, it was a, the board and we were asked, we were, we've been asking for a fee increase in general. And so this was all, part of a, a way that we could do anything we could possibly do in order to keep the lights on basically and keep our employees from having to be laid off. And in the event that we, the legislature was not willing to give us a fee increase. And that was, that was the kind of the rock and the hard place that the board was in at that point. But again, it all evolved very quickly. And it was always meant to be something that wasn't an, an 
item of last resort and it turned out that thankfully it's not something that we actually have to use. No one was really hoping that we would have to exercise that option to begin with. So just a little extra background, definitely appreciate your concern Thank about you. it and um, but a little more information about it. I do appreciate that it was an emergency. Uh, that's how it felt to the board, but in the future, I think we would all hope that when you're talking about our funding and our budget and uh, our oversight of this program, that somebody would come and invite us to uh, participate in the decision making and tell them why that's a problem or why that's a good thing or or develop uh, the complications that might be included in our our own program. So thank you, though. I appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Understood. Actually, I had a question. This might be a conflict of interest question of whether or not, you know, uh, one of us say something in the future, similar happens, um, and that there's something involving the LAP that we don't necessarily agree with individually. Um, you know, is there anything that's preventing us individually um, from either appearing before the Board of Trustees or the, um, you know, the committees, uh, the various committees or seeking out our assembly members or senators um, to express our um, disagreement with the policy that's being decided? Um, is there anything that's preventing that? I can't think of any, but there might be. Uh, well, cer some certainly not. Bad. Sure. Not, I mean, not, um, there's nothing preventing you in your individual capacity for sure. But, but I would say, I, I think all, I speak for all of us in the staff that we would, hopefully we can work with you and make, you know, continue to keep the lines of communication open and help, you know, help you with that discussion um, to the extent possible, but nothing would be preventing you from giving that, that comment, both either to the, to the legislature or to the, to the board. Um, in your own individual capacities, especially. But I do, I do think we can continue to improve on our own communications with you all and, and um, hopefully alleviate that type of uh, situation if possible. And this all, oh, sorry, Phil. No, just, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say this, and we've talked about this before, this all comes from previous um, instances where we felt blindsided as a committee, uh, where decisions were made and we were not consulted and it heavily affected our ability and our, I mean, our funds. So, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I do want to, I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I've clarified this, this certainly wasn't, I mean, that, uh, this is not a decision that the board made. This is a decision the legislature made and they put that into the statute. Right. So I just, I do want to make that clear too. And this, in this particular situation, we, it was, it's a, it is a little different than before, but I understand the point and the, the need to be consulted. And, and so we will do that. But I do want to just say this wasn't something that the board was deciding unilaterally to do. Sorry, go ahead. I think I interrupted. Uh, yeah, I have, I have two issues. One, my name is Philip Spiegel. I've been involved with uh, this uh, program for many, many years. And I'm very disappointed that this came up at all without our knowing about it. So I, I want to reinforce how important we all believe it is for there to be communication in such a way that we find out about these things, not, you know, at the, at the 12th hour. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the other issue is that I don't know how we can express that concern any other way, but I'm really disappointed that this came up again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, lap money is, is lap money. And, and, you know, it, I, I just, I'm hard pressed. I understand what the legislature was, what you're explaining the legislature was trying to do, but there needs to be an open line of communication for all of us. Because this has happened before. The funds were actually taken out. I don't know if you know that. They were actually mm -hmm. taken away and then they had to be put back. So this is not something that's new. Yes. No, I, I do appreciate that history and, and um, I understand your concerns, I do. And, and I would just say too, I think that it's challenging and I'm newer to the committee, but I think it's challenging to be a little bit blindsided as the committee because it impacts the committee work on such a deep level. Um, it impacts the program on such a deep level. And I think that, um, you know, in the name of public protection, this is definitely not a program you want to be taking reserves from. Um, you know, there, in light of the things we're going to discuss later, too, I think that um, 
it's important to remember that this the LIP has a role in public protection when we are assisting attorneys who have had disciplinary action against them um, become more um, engaged with their recovery and more engaged with how they can be healthier versions of themselves. Um, and because that, at the end of the day, protects the public. And I feel like by taking LIP reserves, that is taking away from the protection that that we're supposed to do because it puts us at risk of you know not having enough funds to run the program and i think that's very concerning for me thank you i i, I do appreciate that so i i guess my question and it kind of goes to what justin was saying is you know when we hear about this next if if this happens again and i'm sure it will happen again um you know that we have the opportunity to learn about it early enough to approach the legislature, or whoever is is making this step to take the reserves. And we really say, like, we are able to advocate for the committee and for the program. Um, I, you know, I, I think that, um, lost my train of thought, but just advocating for the program would be really important and not allowing it to move forward in such a way you know, I guess the other thing I, you know, is I hope that the bar will be good stewards of the funding that came from the sale of the of the building so that we don't end up in this situation again anytime soon. Yeah, I appreciate all those comments. I had one more follow up question. Um, did the statute give the state bar any um, uh, policies or procedures or uh, request the bar make regulations about or a notice period about when the uh, the bar might take funds from the reserve. So it yeah. it it, literally, it could be just a, a decision that's made and um, without our opportunity to kind of say don't. Okay. Um, the statute is the way it's worded is just it was just for 2024 only that we would have the ability that the bar would have the ability to use the reserves for purposes other than the lab program. But because we have sold the building, we are not intending to take that money. There's no um, there's no procedure or anything else built into it other than for me to say as staff, we will make every effort to keep you as informed as possible about it. Oh, okay. So it's only for 2024 mm -hmm. and, and it, it reverts back to the way it was before. That's great. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Bridget. Sorry. Sorry, dropped my pen. I think I'm done, at least from my standpoint. I just wanted to update you on that. I don't know if any anyone else has any more questions for me. And if not, I can pass it over to Michelle. Okay. Um my part is really short also. I just wanted to give you all some updates on our numbers as I have been doing at all our meetings. And you know, we're approaching the end of the year. So we have almost our numbers except for our December intakes for what our intakes um, will be in 2023. And we were at 82 intakes at the end of November, which of course, if you're just looking at the intake numbers like from our previous annual reports, is much lower than totals in previous years, but this is the first year that we've been separated by um, support services and monitoring. So the closest thing that we have that we can compare that to is two years ago when we were, you know, last year was, was kind of half and half and very difficult to figure out what was happening with the numbers, but the previous year we were voluntary and mandatory, which was kind of a similar split to the support services and the monitoring. And that was also our highest numbers in many, many years. So if we're comparing to 2021, when our numbers were at the highest, and it was, remember, mandatory and voluntary, the mandatory side had 47 intakes all year. And at this point in the year, well, at the end of November, had 46, only one came in December. So we're at 82 now. So we're definitely surpassing that. Um, and I think that's, um, I don't have the support services side numbers. The support services side is a little bit different now than voluntary. So that's not even a terrific comparison the way that they're taking people in. We don't have people doing um, doing the 
length of programs that we used to. But um, but it seems to me like this is a good indication that people are still using the program, even when we have it divided this way, that people are clearly coming in on the monitoring side for monitoring. They're not coming in to say, you know, like, I just want the recommendations and then I'll go to some groups and see how I like it. Um, and then we've had, um, okay, so the last meeting, which we emailed out the demographics to you, I had an update on the demographics survey that we, um, it's really just been this full year that we've implemented it. We had 73 responses at the time. Now, a few months later, we have eight, 86 responses. I think there were 20-some, um, 25-ish people who came in that time, so about half have responded to this survey, which I think 50% approximately is a, is a pretty good response rate for something that's completely anonymous and completely voluntary. We don't tell them that that's something they must do and it's giving us very personal information about themselves, which a lot of people are not comfortable doing. So, um, so I want you all to know that we're continuing to be getting this data and, um, and I have the numbers really haven't changed that much overall, like in terms of percentages, it's very similar to last time, male, female, we're still 70% male, 30% female. Um, in terms of age of the participants, 31% are in the 30 to 40 year range and 31% are in the 40 to 50 year range. So that's the biggest chunk of people are 30 to 50. Um, almost half, 47% are active attorneys. And then we've got 31% that are bar applicants and the rest are either suspended attorneys, law students, provisional license. In terms of racial, racial and ethnic group breakdown, 60% identified as white. Um, and the, the next highest percentage was Hispanic slash Latino was 16%. Black or African-American, 6%. Asian, 6%. Middle Eastern, North African, 4%, biracial, multiracial, 3%, American, Indian, Alaska, Native, is that, too. Is that a requirement of the program? It's not. That's what I'm saying. This is totally voluntary and anonymous. So we don't even have them put their names on it, but we give it to them at intake. So they're getting a lot of information at the beginning. They're getting their, you know, all the yeah. paperwork to sign up. I don't think it's relevant personally, but yeah, I'm just curious. So we're hoping that it will help us eventually be able to see if we need to target outreach in certain areas, if we need to focus on um, different services that we're offering. It can also help inform on the support services side because they're going to be looking at um, different types of programs that we can offer or support groups or different targeted kinds of interventions. So Michelle, how do, how do those numbers compare to the demographics of the actual state bar numbers? Like 70% uh, male, compared to what's the state bar? I'd like to know how many individuals at the present time have been admitted to the bar and, 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 uh, who actually can practice. Do we have any active? We're at, because I was just looking at this for a different presentation yesterday. I think we're, it's 195,000 or something active attorneys. Yeah. Does that sound so right? We have 100 and, about 100,000 active attorneys and we're only getting 86 Close people. to 200,000. Yeah. In monitoring. In that, yeah, but so, we're not scratching the surface. It's ten percent of any population. So that's exactly why we did this split because not all those people need to be monitored, right? Yeah. They might need other kinds of treatment, other interventions, and that's what they'll be working on to yeah. reach in the support I'm side just, of more education. I'm just saying, from a genetic standpoint, if you look at that population, ten percent at least are going to have substance abuse issues. Not even taking into account the emotional components. Mm -hmm. So we're just scratching the surface, mm -hmm. really. I mean, we're doing the we're doing the best we can. I understand all of that. I just think we we need to come to grips with that as well. Because what what Heather said is is the, the most important thing about this program, and I've maintained this for years in the work I did with the medical board and in the work I've done with LAP. The whole point of this is for public protection, and uh, you know it's wonderful that the individuals' careers are saved in many instances by programs like these, but the, the basic the basic premise is that it's for public protection, and you have to approach approach the legislature and the the, uh, the board the, of the uh, of the bar because many of them don't understand that. Um, so we're you know, but we're just scratching the surface, 
if you look at it from a medical standpoint. Well, and one of the statistics that I was going to say is all related to that, how many substance use. The last one on this part of the categories are sexual orientation and identity, 83% heterosexual, lesbian, gay, not listed, 16, total to 16%. <laughs> I didn't do the math for it. And then huh. the reason that they were seeking help, this is at intake, um, so it might end up that the diagnosis is different later, but at intake... 50% said they were coming for a substance use problem, 21% for a mental health problem, 11 for personal, 11% for 11 for personal or job stress, 6% for career counseling, and 12% for other. And people can check off more than one box in those categories. So that's. So, and this is on the monitoring side? Yeah, these are only people on the monitoring yeah. side. Do we know how many people are sort of under the jurisdiction of? the trial, Office of Trial Counsel for yes. various infractions. I, I'm just trying to see like how many are actually getting to monitoring versus how many are actually being investigated at this point. Oh, in terms of how many are being investigated, no. We don't know how many okay. are being investigated or how many are in the, the regular dis discipline track. We know about the alternative discipline okay. program mm -hmm. and all of those people get referred over to lab. Right. And then the last question that I have data on is that survey also asks, are you required to participate by moral character, ADP, or probation? Mm -hmm. And 45% said yes, but 55% said no. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I do think there's opportunities for outreach, but, you know, the question is, I guess, does that fall into the support services or the monitoring side? You know, and... <sighs> That's like a legitimate question in terms of, you know, are we trying to attract people to prevent behaviors that are contrary to our role as attorneys, or are we reactive? And I think that's where we have to kind of figure out where we're coming from, is if we're going to be proactive, then that requires a different level of outreach. But if we're going to be more reactive, and maybe that's what the monitoring side is, more reactive, then that's that's different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, then we then yes, it's gonna the numbers are gonna be lower. But if we're saying no, we want to catch those who are struggling before they get to the point of discipline, then that's something we have to figure out how to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's exactly. If you, if you can figure that out, we'll go down in history. <laughs> <laughs> And that's exactly what well, we're trying the to do. Which sounds great if she did 76 presentations. Right. That's, right. that's great. Right. And that's and, and Lita is doing that on the support that's services the side. So that's what we're doing. trying to offer both sides of it. Yeah. So there's the monitoring and and you know that's people who are saying, no, it's it's 45, 55, not quite half and half, but basically there's a lot of people who are saying they don't have to be here. That doesn't mean that they don't suspect that down the road there will be discipline. A lot of the people tell us um, who are applicants that like their dean told them to come in, like admissions didn't require it, but they suspect that, or that, you know, they've talked to an attorney, they've talked to other students yeah. who have said that this will be a good idea to join lab yeah. at this time. So, um, so word is getting out, um, but I think that's exactly what we're hoping to do with the, with the support services monitoring split is we've got, the monitoring can be really successful at that. And then let's offer other things that will be more proactive and not reactive to people who already have a diagnosis that you need to qualify for monitoring to have it already. Right. But you can, um, you know, have a concern. You can have work stress. You can have problems managing right. your practice. And how can we like support those people at the beginning? Yeah. The presentations yeah. to the law school for some of these things that we're doing, I think. Mm -hmm. To uh, address Heather's issue of proactive versus reactive, you know, there is a, a groundswell currently of the uh, attorney wellness, you know, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, health and wellness. Uh, I know the CLA is involved in doing that and reaching out. Of course, the ABA is kind of, it's kind of their baby. And so uh, I think that's encouraging to the proactive side of our role. And we could partner up with people and learn more about how to address those things to those bodies. Yeah, I sat on the CLA board and I was on the wellness committee. So it's a very sort of near and dear to my heart kind of thing. And so I agree with you, um, James, that we need to uh, 
that partnering would probably be very helpful. Um, and, you know, on the support services side, I don't know how much we do with that, but, you know, figuring out what it is that people need right now, not just to have groups or this or that, but like, how do we help people have overall wellness, you know, when they're struggling with their job, when they're struggling with, you know, am I going to pass the bar? Am I going to like, what, what does my career look like? You know, we have all those pieces, but it's like, how do we market them in such a way that it becomes that proactive approach of like, we're going to partner with CLA on this, you know, instead of us just presenting at the CLA meeting, about lab, mm -hmm. you know, like actually partnering with them on a program or something mm -hmm. that that becomes, um, you know, su supportive, and that attorneys would look at it and go, oh, this is a great idea, and this is something I could benefit from, um, and I don't feel like, oh, I'm just doing it under the state bar because I feel like in some ways that's a little bit of a deterrent because they're like, oh, the state bar is going to know that I'm doing this and they're going to, mm -hmm. you know, like tell on me and I'm, you know, I'm going to get found out. Whereas I think if you partner with someone, it, it tempers that um, fear of being found out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I know that CLA wanted to take on the voluntary lot program at one point, um, which, you know, is sort of neither here nor there at this point. But um, I think that there are other groups and, and ways we can partner to bring in people to do that public protection that Phil was talking about, that I was talking about, to sort of make sure that, you know, try our best to ensure that people are protected and that attorneys are protected in many ways too, mm -hmm. so. Martin. Okay, uh, I was just wondering, you know, to put this in a context, what percentage, just speaking about alcoholics, what percentage of people who ever go through successfully the AA program or any recovery program do so voluntarily? I don't know what the numbers are, but I suspect the majority are people who are compelled either by the courts or the employer or some entity. So I was just thinking to myself, well, why would lawyers be any different? In other words, I would expect that outreach would not be terribly impactful. Just just my thought. I don't know what other people think. I think it depends on the outreach you're doing and what you're trying to reach out for. I can tell you my experience has been that I got sober because my job was on the line, but I went to AA because that was a choice. And you can get sober without participating in a program. I think it's a little more challenging at that point. Um, but I also know people who got sober before they became attorneys, um, but still struggle with addictive behaviors, emotional sobriety, um, things that come along with getting sober. Um, I know people who um, are got sober as lawyers, didn't have a problem with their job, didn't have DUIs, but got into AA because they wanted the support. And I think if we can find a way to track that support, like how do we support them, you know, maintaining the anonymity that, you know, AA has, but allow them to be participating because I'll be honest, the hardest thing for me when I was an attorney, well, I'm still an attorney, but when I was a dependency attorney is I would go to AA meetings and I would see parents there that were, that I had sentenced to, you know, had uh, they had to go to AA meetings. And so I knew if they were working the program or not working the program, but it also became, a, you know, I want to maintain my anonymity. And so we have the other bar, we have different opportunities for that. But if we as a state bar can say, like, here's how we can help people stay sober, stay mentally fit, you know, without you know, so that they feel it's a safe environment. I think that's the biggest challenge is making sure that people feel it's a safe environment to come into. That's just my thought. And certainly that assists on the prevention side and on the, uh, the side of proactive nature of this program, because I know that uh, personally, I was 
trying, trying, trying to get myself well. And if I, if I would have found a safe place that I thought was safe and anonymous and confidential where my reputation would be affected and that I didn't think that I would get exposed, I would have tried to take advantage of that. In fact, I did try to take advantage of it at one point in time, but it wasn't available to me. So, uh, you know, I think that most people I know that are sober for any period of time are sober because they, they're on the voluntary side of that. And so maybe you get involved because you're uh, mandated to get involved, but once it carries on, it's certainly on the voluntary side. And But my personal experience was uh, if there was a safe place to go, I would have been there. And, uh, and so I would have uh, tried to get help for myself in digging into that. And it wasn't available for me, so. That's for, for that reason about, uh... oh, I'm sorry. Was Tracy next or me? I think Tracy was. Okay. I'll be brief. I just, you know, I have a little bit that I can add because of, you know, working here at the public defender's office in Orange County, we have probably the largest, you know, number of attorneys employed and they consistently ask for trainings and outreach for wellness and resources. And they, there's not a lot out there. I know they'll, they'll attend the lab one that goes around, but it, it kind of is the same, you know, it doesn't really change. They're actually looking for help and they're not worried about, you know, anonymity. So I do think there's a, there's a group out there for sure that would, that would like more outreach. Um, I don't know what, what that looks like. We've had some social workers and, you know, psychiatrists come here and present programs. Uh, we had one that was really successful where they actually passed out um, questionnaires that you could um, fill out on your own anonymously and get scored. And you could tell if you're at high risk, middle risk, low risk. So you can kind of give an idea of how close you are to burnout or, or where you're at. So I, I do, I, I appreciate everyone's comments on that. I also just wanted to mention, you know, that Heather, I agree with partnering with other entities is a fantastic idea. Um, joint programs just tend to get better attendance. So in, in any event, I think we're doing great, but we can obviously improve in some areas. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I was going to just say, you know, the topic of anonymity kind of got raised in this discussion. And I was just thinking to myself, if I was a lawyer and I wanted to be to get help and I didn't want anybody to know about it, I would just find myself, uh, you know, the most nondescript AA meeting somewhere in San Jose where none of my upscale associates or clients would ever wander into. And that's where I would go without advising the state bar or dealing with the state bar. I was just wondering if that is a likely scenario and might account for you know, the low numbers of people who are seeking help through LAP. This has been studied many, many times. Working with professionals that have substance abuse issues is very difficult. And the success rate is lower than the general population because of this fear of disclosure. Uh, you know, nobody believes that there's anonymity. And, uh, and, and actually, there's no such thing. After people get involved in programs like AA and CA and NA, they realize after a few years that there isn't any such thing. And then they get to the point where it doesn't matter. People who really are sick and tired of being sick and tired don't care. But but your point is, well, I mean, it, it, you, can, you can look it up online. It's been very well studied. Professionals like physicians and, and attorneys, uh, social workers, things like that. I mean, it's very, very difficult. And the success rate is very low. A lot of and I can say my experience has been like at this point I'm 11 years in I like I don't care who knows I'm sober and who doesn't like people know my mental health like and it's not like I just go around shouting it from the rooftops but I also want community at this point in my career I want community with people who have similar struggles that I'm not going to feel like I'm going to walk into a room of like yeah it's great to find a nondescript AA meeting but if there's not a single other professional in there 
it doesn't matter because they're not going to understand my struggle to like, you know, go into, you know, if you work for a law firm and or any place, there's a drinking culture. It exists. And it's like, you know, do I walk into that happy hour that my, my job is having and how do I like manage my sobriety? How do I, you know, when, when people are engaging in an unhealthy way with me, how do I set those boundaries? What does it look like? Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of factors. It's not just about sobriety. It's about mental health. It's about, like Michelle said, career trajectory, wellness. Um, I, I think there's a lot of factors that can be addressed um, if we just really take a step and, and really look at what are some of the things that are impacting attorneys. And I don't know, like the state bar loves their surveys, so maybe they can like throw it into a survey somewhere. You know, <laughs> like, you know, what are what are the things that are impacting you that are affecting you? What do you feel like stresses you out? This is, you know, we just want to know so we can help you, you know. I don't know if anyone will fill it out, but. Right. Okay. Thank you for the robust, <laughs> robust discussion on that. Did, so, you, did you want to respond to? Yeah, I just wanted to say really quickly that I really appreciate everybody kind of bringing these issues out. We do um, have representatives on the CAL, CLA Wellness Committee, including Michelle and Lita. So I think that that partnering is going to be something that we can do pretty easily. The other thing that I wanted to mention is as we move into 2024, the State Bar is really trying to focus on creating different types of toolkits that can be utilized at the local levels. Um, and in, including in those we do, we are creating a wellness one. So hopefully once that's out, you can all spread the word to the different organizations that you're part of if people wanna take these things on. And, and that's really kind of trying to get at the preventative side of things. Um, I'll just also mention that Ken is working on what lap support looks like um, and kind of dealing with these the different issues that were raised today. So this discussion is really, really helpful for him. So I just want to thank the committee for that and let you know that we do hear you and we are trying to um, grapple with some of these issues and um, increase our utilization rates on the support side as well. Any further uh, comments or questions on the staff report? Seeing none, um, we'll move to the next, we'll move to the business section of the agenda. And item 3A is approval of the April 28, 2023 open session minutes. Are there any corrections or modifications to the open session minutes? Seeing none, may I have a motion and a second? So moved. Sure, I'll second it. So uh, I have Heather Benton um, moving and Philip Spiegel second. Michelle, please call the roll. Heather Benton? Yes. James Hiding? Yes. Tracy Lesage? Yes. Philip Spiegel? Yes. Martin Williams? Yes. Elise Yanni? Yes. Justin De La Cruz? Yes. Okay, this all yeses. So, um, so the motion passes. And the minutes are so approved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is item 3B, and this is discussion and possible action on the financial assistance working group report and recommendation. Um, I don't know who's, is that you, Michelle? Um, so the benchmarks group, Dr. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The bench group, benchmark. Is this benchmark? Yeah. We're on 3B. Oh, so I the, sorry, that was the one that's right on the agenda, but wrong on your okay. paper. So, <laughs> to start all over again, <laughs> this is item 3B, and this is the discussion of the benchmarks for success working group and uh, report and recommendation. Yes, I think Dr. Andy was planning on presenting this. Yeah, so we met. I can't remember exactly how many times we've met this year, but it, it was a handful, probably five or six. And um, as a reminder, our task was to kind of figure out what, how, how people successfully complete the program, um, how we came up with that like three-year time period, um, 
and if there was specific benchmarks that we could put into um like like i remember we were talking about revising the manual for the whole program um, and we kind of realized we needed to come up with some concrete benchmarks to be able to include in there so that people know if they're on track and if they've successfully completed the program so as we started meeting early in the year um, we ended up it, it just the question kept becoming broader and broader and more nebulous um, and then maybe halfway through the year, we were able to kind of narrow back down. Um, and so we, we've kind of realized, uh, Michelle reached out to all of the other laps um, over the listserv for all the other states. And it turns out nobody else really had these benchmarks either. Um, and so we were kind of starting from square one. Um, but Michelle reminded us of um, something that, that used to be in lab called successful participation. So it's not necessarily a graduation, but it's kind of a stamp almost of like, you've successfully done what you need to do in this program. Um, and so we created, um, well, I guess we didn't create, we kind of rebranded um, reports that people submit to the, um, the case review team, sorry, not the case review team, uh, the clinical review team. Um, and we renamed it Participation Summary and Maintenance Plan. And we've kind of started to come up with different components of that that we'd like to see um, that the clinical review team can look at to determine um, where somebody's at in terms of their recovery. So that includes things like, are they able to recognize um, the like nature and extent of the problem that brought them to LAP in the first place and what kinds of things have they done to specifically address those problems um, and how they're interfering with work. So that's kind of where we're at now. Um, I think I think we're still kind of in the, the stages of finalizing what that um, summary is going to look like. And I'm sure I'm leaving some things out, Michelle and Heather, if, if you have more. Um, I. I want to make sure those of you who are um, for me on the screen <laughs> in, your, in your houses, you're on your computers. If you've looked at the agenda, there are attachments now to the agenda um, that has a memo. The people who are here in person have paper copies of it. They There is a summary of each of the working groups, what they worked on over the year, and this proposed successful completion process for um, for the two people in the working group, which is you know cut and pasted from what we had emailed that we were that we were proposing to have people write for their plan the the um, like relapse prevention plan uh, what do we call it participation summary maintenance plan is in here and um, and some recommendations for for the group now for next steps which were. Two things. One is to talk about adopting this process of successful participation. And one was the other thing we talked about, which was um, potentially, like like you said, at least as we, we looked at other labs, and I was gonna say most, I mean, really most if not all of them are monitoring based on a length of time. And we've really tried to stay away from that here because we want it to be individual to the person and what their specific needs are. And maybe not everybody needs five years, not everybody needs three years. So that was one of the reasons we came up with these, with this different process here is so if somebody doesn't want to be here for the three years that it takes to successfully complete LAP, there's this other designation that they can get and have a determination and a letter from us saying that they were successful in the participation that they, that they did do while they were here. But the other part of that is, well, then do we need a successful completion process? Maybe we monitor for the amount of time that the referring agency wants us to monitor. So the court wants them to be monitored for two years. The court wants them to be monitored for 10 years. We can monitor them for as long as, as needed, um, which is kind of like what happens with admissions. Admissions will give the person an advance and they will say your advance is for six months, your advance is for 18 months. They come to lab for that amount of time and then 
admissions makes their decision about admitting or not. So, and usually, they, you know, we say, you're welcome to stay, but usually they leave after that because they've done what they came there intending to do. So, um, so the other recommendation is to obtain input from outside stakeholders, especially the state bar court on the idea of abolishing the successful completion concept altogether in favor for only monitoring of the length of time that the participant or the referral source desires. When we came up with this idea um, to make that recommendation, we didn't know that also on the agenda, Bridget, would be the conversation about the alternative discipline program. And so this might really be um, well connected to that topic, which is the last one on the agenda today. So um, we can have that, or we can wait until the, the ADP conversation to have that. I was going to say, can we wait until the conversation to kind of talk about the second piece of the recommendation, mm -hmm. like the recommendations? Because mm -hmm. I think um, looking at the report, it's really important to kind of navigate those two together. Mm -hmm. So I would just move that we table it a little bit until we get to three for C or D. That's just my. I have no preference. So, so at, at a minimum, though, at least we want to talk now about recommendation two here is to add this process of successful participation. Yes, Heather, you agree with that or you want to wait? For all I would like to wait oh, just all because okay. I think that the oversight conversation about the ADP is going to come into the successful participation too okay. a little bit because, you know, if we actually do what is recommended, then it may change what we do with this so i don't i don't know we'll wait until we have that based on what i was reading in the in the notes well i will i mean i will just add that it is relevant to the adp but then this is my understanding is I, that this process applies to lap participants as a whole like separate from just those that are in the adp program so to the extent you want to separate the conversation, that's fine, or we can, all, we can have it in general. But at, at least this particular item, I think, is broader than just the ADP discussion. Just to kind of yeah. I, recommendation one about talking to stakeholders is going to be related to the to ADP conversation because we'll be talking to the state board court. So we can probably do that all together, talk to the stakeholders about the ADP issue and about last successful completion issue. Um, and successful completion is mostly um, used by participants who are in ADP or who are after ADP and now on probation were required as part of their ADP to successfully complete lab. Number two, the successful part participation process will probably um, at this time be more useful to people who are not in ADP. It will be for the people who are here for other reasons who aren't required by the court to complete and they want to get some other designation or that we think is a good idea to be able to provide them with the designation where our, as our hands might have been tied before we can't really recognize the good work somebody has done because they didn't hit the three year mark specifically but um but maybe it's been two and a half and we feel like they've accomplished what they can accomplish with monitoring they have no requirement to complete let's be able to to celebrate the work that they've done and be able to give people that encouragement to continue working without the structure of the program if they don't need it right now in the judgment of, as, as you can see in here, the rest of their treatment team. So, you know, we have the suggestion that people talk to their their um, therapists if they have psychiatrists, sponsors, talk to the your lab group facilitator and people around you and see is this a good idea to stop your monitoring right now and let's make a plan for how you're going to maintain the gains that you have maintained and continue um, after the structure of lap is removed and then meet with the clinical team who can decide um, just per individual, yes, does that seem, seem appropriate for this person? So, so I think we can do that part now. So the goal is early early termination of their monitoring, right? Or that- Well, the... it is ending the monitoring, the word early, I mean, there's no time on it, so it's not early. It's I late. Mean, earlier than you know, three years. Or, yes, earlier than the minimum requirements for for completion. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a generally a good, great idea. But uh, I agree with Heather also that we can have. I mean, I don't know why we wouldn't just take the one before the other, and just talk about the uh, alternative discipline program first, and then just we can always address this later. You know. 
and then we'll understand the distinctions, but why make a decision now when we can have the full discussion? Okay. Uh, anyone feel strongly that you want to vote on it now or anything? Just a question of, in terms of the successful participation, it comes after ADP or it comes alongside of ADP? I guess that's my question for clarity. This new successful participation uh -huh. can be used by any participant, ADP or not. Okay. Um, if they want us to make that determination, likely they will not, if they are planning to continue to complete lab, because there will be no need to, um, we didn't actually say that the person had to leave lab after this. I suppose they could go through the process yeah. if they want to have the practice of, um, you know, to go through I'm, the... I'm dense. Do we have a specific list of criteria? It's, that it's on page three. It's a little... It's page three where it's the ABC... It's right before that. We kind of yes, started... Yeah. Right there. We kind of started that discussion at our most recent meeting, so that's not as fleshed out as, as kind of the other parts. See, because people like, uh, like lawyers, I think, would appreciate having a list of criteria. If there's a list of criteria, you either meet them or you don't. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, it, it's really not going to be subjective. Yeah, this group really struggled with that because the criteria then would be... Um, different if you're here for depression if you're here for anxiety sure. if you're here for substance use for all the above so that's why it, you it have came to, we have to have two different this criteria one for the emotional component and one for the substance abuse yeah. component i should say and i think the hard part was coming up with i mean the the substance use is a little bit easier because you can measure sobriety more objectively yeah. Uh, yeah. but that's what we were having a more difficulty with um, in terms of the more emotional component because it can be so variable. Um, so we talked about kind of like individualized treatment planning, in which case everybody would have a separate kind of checklist. Um, so that's why that discussion kind of came later is just because it it broadened out very quickly and we needed some time to rein it back in. And maybe, I'm sorry, maybe this was my oversight that I didn't put in here. Um, there was also the the idea that we were supposed to have, I don't see it, that they, that there was, that this is after a minimum of one year. So it's enough time right. for the, for the team to get to know the person, to have the issues specifically identified and having had substantial compliance with the monitoring plan for the last six months of that. So that would mean that whatever the, the diagnosis is, it's been outlined on the monitoring plan, what the appropriate treatment is for that. And that if there's sub substantial compliance for one year, that kind of is the outline of this is sure. the concrete, what they had to do. Sure. So I will make sure to make that. It's in, you've got that it's on page three. I don't know why I'm not seeing it, but. It's, it's buried. Okay. <laughs> That's the first thing I looked for okay. when I was looking to see. That's what we need to have. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So it's the monitoring plan that makes it personalized to each individual for what their diagnosis is. I think that's the key. I, I still, and we talked about this because we mm -hmm. talked about looking at evidence-based models and mm -hmm. I'm looking at my notes here um, and really kind of honing it on um, not just their own insight, but sort of objective criteria as well. And I think that's the one thing that I didn't attend the last meeting, so I may have missed something, um, but that we, particularly for sobriety, have very objective criteria about what it means to be sober um, and what it means to be in sobriety. You know, if we say, okay, they've been in here a year, but they have one month of sobriety because they keep relapsing, how is that, you know, like we want to actually and they're like i'm done like i want to do successful right you know like where's mm -hmm. the requirement that they actually maintain that sobriety you know i i get i guess i guess that would be in their case plan but i i just worry about things that are not quite as defined um mm -hmm. because you know then it makes it subjective then you end up with problems of like well my caseworker doesn't like me so they're just not letting me go so you know, kind of thing, and so, that's what concerns me. So just taking a step back here, this is this 
proposal is still in the works. This is more of a concept, right? My understanding yeah. is that this criteria yeah. is not not fixed. So I think generally what, in my mind, what we're discussing is whether we think the successful completion concept is a good idea and whether the working group should keep moving forward with creating more specific criteria for that um, as opposed to digging into what that criteria should be. Um, that's in my mind what we're potentially yeah, deciding. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so like I cool. said, the, the last meeting is when we really started to kind of narrow down some of these things. And so like Michelle was talking about at least six months of substantial compliance with the monitoring plan. Um, and so we're still kind of figuring out how to define what that actually means, but that would include um, like maintaining sobriety, um, just like things that are in the treatment plan. So that would be a requirement for successful participation is complying with the plan. And we talked about, um, one of the things we talked about is that this would apply to both ADP and non-ADP participants. So whatever the criteria is we come up with would be sort of across the broad spectrum of people participating in lab. Um, I think that's what we talked about, right? right. Because yeah. we were focusing on staying in our lane and what somebody chooses to do with their, you know, they decide they don't want to be in ADP anymore. They decide who knows what right. people decide for their own legal process is separate from what our clinical right. recommendations are. Right. Yeah. And we also talked about a collaborative court model. So I think Justin is right that we would need to go back and kind of like really hone in on what does it mean to be, what is evidence based look like? What is what does it really look like? You know, I'm thinking something very similar to like what they're doing in, in across the state with the care courts, like, you know, something where there's been a, there's, there's some, there's a way to monitor what is happening. And that's what I'm kind of sensing. Is there any information from the drug courts about this? What do they use as criteria? Um, from what I have found, it's, it, it's time, it's, you know, two years, whatever the program length is. Because if that's what the drug courts are using, maybe that's, uh, maybe that could be a, we could consider that. And that was for completion. And that's, for example, like what I was saying, many of the other states or were telling me that it's, um, they will, people will sign their contract. So if, whether they call, call it a monitoring agreement, contract, whatever, the contract includes an amount of time. Yeah. And if they are not following the contract successfully, then they will either be terminated before then, you know, they will maybe give, be given a chance to get back in line sure. or they're terminated from it. And that's, that's it. Otherwise they follow it. And then after the time is up, then they're done. But what we have is kind of this hybrid of, we have a standard of a minimum of three years. And then if they're not meeting it, then that, you know, if it's a matter of relapse that starts the three years over again, and there's all these other things we want people to be able to be making ongoing lifestyle changes. It's much more complicated. So mm -hmm. you can't say to somebody, you're going to be monitored for three years period. It's well, it's a process and it depends. And it's, and of course, attorneys don't like that. They want to know, like, you know, what's this going to be? The uh, CSAM, the California Society of Addiction Medicine used to use the term uh, evidence-based community standards. And maybe one of the things we could look at is what uh, if CSAM has any. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was on an oversight committee with them, but all these things are semantic. I mean, at the end of the day, and if you want to know where the ones that we have now came from, they came from the medical boards program because Janice Tebow, who was the first director of LAP, just basically took most of what was all in the medical boards program and put it into this one, and that so that's where that all that stuff came from. You want to change the, you know, it's a semantic, this is, we're dealing with a bunch of semantics. You know, it's like, it's like either you're sober or you're not. Well, but, when you access this online, there's a link in here for another state's lab, which there's now, I don't know if they had the Federation of State Physician Health Programs back when this was created. Probably not. But there's now a group for physician monitoring, the national organization right. that, you know, all the states have their individual yeah. programs. And so they have a, a set of standards. And so a lot of the labs are getting on board sure. with what those And they may be are. using something from ASAM, which is, you know, the American right. Society of Addiction. So we have to... Yeah, I, I think I fully support the idea of successful completion as a concept, you know, to promote that with an 
with a, a earlier than three year uh, quote unquote graduation summa cum laude, right? And uh, <laughs> absolutely. But but the uh, I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything when you said that the standards would be the same ADP or non ADP that they would have to comply with ADP all provisions in order to have a successful sure. conclusion, right? We don't monitor anything about ADP. The judges do. So we well, don't. We, we couldn't find that they successfully completed if they didn't complete the ADP or they didn't participate successfully in the ADP. They they can because it's it's very separate. Somebody could get for whatever reason get terminated from ADP. We'll probably keep them lap if they're following our standards, and it would be very very unlikely. But if they did something else, for example, that got them kicked out of ADP, if they you know got arrested for some other crime of moral turpitude, no longer qualify for ADP. I'm making this up. I've never heard this happen before, but in theory, maybe it could. But they're they still seem committed to their sobriety and their program, whatever we're having them do. We'll keep them in lap. They could potentially graduate from lap, complete. He's graduating complete. Okay, well, that's something I think the working group should at least address. You know, whether or not that uh, ADP has to have compliance in order to have a successful quote unquote successful okay. completion letter or we'll see. graduation, so I, whatever. The proposal here is a new concept of su successful participation. Right. So that would be the earlier right the earlier thing. So but I, I so think, not completion. So not completion. I think but the I distinction think between I, it makes sense, but I think the distinction is like if you if someone's participating in lap but they're also ordered to make restitution. Yeah. But they do everything right for lap but they don't do the restitution piece for whatever reason doesn't mean that they can't be a successful participation in lab. It just means that they probably won't be done with the ADP program because they have pieces of it. They still need to meet. So I think that's the distinction and the separation. Uh, would, uh, so would there be a provision in the, in the findings or whatever in the group, you know, when they go to the clinical review or whatever they go to that, although this person didn't complete the ADP program for X reason, we find that they've successfully completed the LAP. I that mean, I don't know. I don't know. Don't, I don't know how important the ADP stuff is to the completion of some person's program. You know, no, maybe they, maybe some people think it's really important and some people don't. I, I would think they probably go hand in hand if the person is working on a recovery program, they're most likely also working on towards what the court wants them to for ADP. But we really keep it very separate that our lap standards are our, our lap standards. ADP has their own standards. The judge makes sure they're doing those. We make sure they're doing these. Okay, so just a query, would that be a consideration for the for whether or not this person successfully completed the LAP? So, in other words, we're all sitting around and we're determining whether this person successfully completed the LAP. Would one of our considerations be whether they completed the ADP and if not, why not? Well, again, you have to have a list of criteria. I think that should be one of the criteria. Yeah, I agree. That's a criterion we need to look at. Well, and I think that goes back to the the request of the ad hoc commission anyway of what us over doing it over mm -hmm. looking over the ADP and kind of overhauling it. So, yes, that could be a criteria. But I think what we're trying to do, kind of like Justin said, is just determine if we want to move forward with this yeah. and continue moving. Yeah, forward. I'm all good with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. that Sorry, can I, can I jump in? Um, that's also why we're moving away from the word completion and in participation yeah. because. Ultimately, we're kind of viewing that as the decision for the court, whether or not they're complete with the program. But we're saying, based on our program requirements, you have successfully participated in the program. And then the court can make a decision about the sufficiency of that. And this group had a huge task. I think a year ago, when it was created, did not know how big of a bite we were taking off here that was way too much to chew so the success successful completion or in other words graduation process was originally part of the idea that this group would look at and we ended up that's where we ended up with this first recommendation is this is too much to decide without all of the stakeholder input what's going on with the court to decide if we can even touch this at this time um 
it, it was just too complicated. And so the focus was away from the completion process toward, okay, what else can we do to recognize the work that people do in program? And right now they just like withdraw, they're done. They, like we said on here, there's the one year certificate, they get that or they finish their abeyance if they're here for admissions and then they leave. And then they're just counted basically as a withdrawal in our numbers. And we don't, we have the opportunity of having them meet with the team like everybody else and say, good job, you know, we meet at the beginning, but then we don't meet at the end and say, good job, here's what you've accomplished. Here's a formal plan that is written out to say, the admissions people do that a little bit, but basically a formal plan to written out to say, here's, here's where I've come from, where I am now, and what my plans are to maintain or continue my gains. So that's what this process does is, if the judge has ordered somebody to do successful completion, they probably won't even be looking at this. They're not going to want to do it because they're going to want to wait to do completion and do what the judge says. But for the other people who are not here for that reason, this is something that will be a way for us to recognize, like I said, the, the work that was done and have more of a rounding out of the experience for people instead of just quote unquote dropping out because they're done and they feel like they don't need monitoring anymore. So here's the process that we will do instead. Would this uh, replace, or how does the letter of insight come into play with respect to this determination? The insight, I think that's two, right? The participant summary. Yeah, it was number two. So they can still do that. And if they're, if they need it for the office of admissions, they should still do it. Okay. We, if they also at that time are meeting the criteria for successful participation and they want to do it the process they go through for insight is really similar they'll meet with the clinical review team we can probably decide that if we want to do it at the same time at the same meeting or if they want to do that you know stay on for a little while and do this afterwards um but the way we've like created the concept is it doesn't replace that process of insight and I think the input from stakeholders is really important in this process, in the insight process too, because one of the things we talked about is really what are the judges looking for when they're determining whether somebody is ready to be released from the program or not, and or ADP or whatever it is. What are the, what are the judges looking for? And we don't really know at this point what the judges are looking for. We're kind of like shooting in the dark. And so I think that that conversation with the judges will really help us understand how they're seeing this and how much how much weight are they even giving to the lab program? Mm -hmm. Like, are they really considering what the reports look like? Or are they just kind of like, well, they've met everything, so, you know, be gone. Like, I, I don't know. And it's a really important thing to look at because if they're not considering us, then maybe that's where the ADP overhaul comes in. And it's like, we need to have them like put, add more weight to what we're saying, because I think successful participation is really important because you can go through an entire pro It's like, like when you go to AA, you, there's no completion in AA, but successful participation is going to meetings, working the steps, having a sponsor. Mm -hmm. Like that's the biggest factor of AA. You have to do all of that stuff. <laughs> and it's like, if you're not doing it, you're not really successfully participating. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll be honest, I'm not a real successful participant right now because I don't have a sponsor. I'm not working this up. But that doesn't mean that I'm not participating in it. It just means that it's probably not the most successful participation, you know, and that's, subje that's subjective. You can talk right. to 10 different people and you'll get 16 opinions. Of course. And so, yeah. I was just using AA as an yeah. example of like, what what is it? It, it, it can look successful participation can look very different. You know, there's usually cr some criteria, mm -hmm. but I think when you're talking about successful participation, it really is about like, are you taking the steps you can take or are you just going, like, are you going to meetings and you're not participating? You never speak at a meeting. You like, you know, attend like once every six weeks, you know, I mean, you know, that's maybe for our purposes is different, but I'm just saying there is participation and there's not participation. And I think that's what we have to distinguish is like, if someone's really participating in the act, like the, the act, actively participating in their recovery. I think that's, and what that's where the to... clinical judgment comes in. Right. And for what it's worth, that was some of the feedback from people at other labs was basically, you're all nuts for trying to do this. Like this is not, there are not objective criteria that 
exist for this because it's based on the individual and their personal experience with their personal recovery from their same other person could have the same diagnosis but it's a different experience for that mm -hmm. person with the same diagnosis than it is for you so how do we say for you this one person what does success for you look like and it's different than anybody else which is where we came up with having to go through this whole process of talking to people writing about it meeting with the clinical team and then by the way what's not in here that um dr yenny had forwarded is on the other side from the staff perspective outlining some questions for the staff to look yeah. at so here's what you you're asking all the people who come in for these clinical review team meetings some um some guidelines for the way to look at it which um she got, I believe, from, from the work at the hospital of how you're like looking at the patients and evaluating how they're doing. So, um, so we'll that, have that on the staff side. And that goes to that evidence-based kind of criteria mm -hmm. of like, what does it really look like, particularly with the mental health. And I think, you know, one of the things I'd love to look at is care for and see mm -hmm. what is their criteria. I know it's brand new, but how are they determining when someone successfully completes the care court program and can be exited from the program? Can we take some of that criteria, you know, and, and incorporate it into what we do? Because I'm sure they're using an evidence-based model of what it means for mental health. What it, what does it look like? Because that's really what their focus is, is on mental health. So it would be interesting to just say, okay, can we, can we find out how they're doing it and what they're using as criteria? And does that, does any of that work for us? Mm -hmm. um, as, as far as, as far as the uh, substance abuse, uh, issues. I would suggest that we should get in touch with CSAM or ASAM to see what, because they may have some specific writings on these on these mm -hmm. issues. And uh, you know, it's it's nice to celebrate of all, all these things, and and we're being very sensitive about it. But at the end of the day, it's reasonable to have criteria to finish a program, <laughs> and we're never going to be able to do it perfect. Yeah. We have a concept of progress and not perfection. And I think, you know, and I think that that's really, you know, I think we're entitled to have criteria where we're having people come in. If they need money, we're giving them money. And you'll see later when we talk about it, we're going to give them the money, not even ask for them to pay it back anymore. So I think it's reasonable for us to have reasonable criteria that they need to meet. And, you know, I... So are we, do we need a motion or anything to move forward? Do you, does the subcommittee need direction on moving forward with uh, um, studying more, creating, um, finalizing maybe the successful participation um, concept? I or I feel like that's now, a. But maybe we need something to just a also, motion to proceed with the successful participation approach mm -hmm. instead of like benchmarks, but to proceed with that approach and then mm -hmm. to be able to speak to outside stakeholders. But I also wanted to be sensitive about our timing, about whether we have something due. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask either Bridget, Kathy, or Erica, or Michelle, um, whoever knows. We, I know we were tasked with doing this earlier in the year. Um, I didn't know if we had like a deadline. I know we have a deadline for ADP, but I didn't know if there was like some kind of deadline that we were tasked with meeting um, in considering this issue. So I wanted to also kind of bring that up because that may inform what we need to decide today. I believe this was a self-imposed, a committee-imposed deadline of at the end of this year. So this final final meeting. So this is what the group was proposing by this point. So I think the group can decide we accept this or we accept moving the focus away from also talking about successful completion because now that might be part of the ADP, but we talk about um, this successful participation process. Well, this is a two pronged approach, right? The recommendation mm -hmm. dual, yes. right? And so if there is a motion required, I move that we adopt the recommendations on page four, that uh, they can, that the committee continue and this oversight committee continue to gain input from outside stakeholders, especially the state board court on the idea of abolishing success, uh, sick, uh, no, I'll, I'll withdraw that motion. I'll just uh, I'll just move that, uh, that the committee go move forward on adding a process for participants 
participants to obtain a determination of successful completion personalized to the individual? It's actually successful participation. Successful what? Participation. Yes. Sorry. You said completion. So oh. I just wanted to check Su and make sure you were okay participation. with the participation. No, that's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Did so I say completion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, participation. So just to um, summarize, uh, uh, Jim moves to uh, for the committee to uh, adopt the recommendation number two on page four. Correct. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Can I make a friendly amendment? You may. Uh, that we look at number one and just um, instead of saying successful completion, uh, that we just uh, add that we would obtain input from outside stakeholders um, regarding the successful participation program. I'll accept that amendment. Okay, who wants to summarize that? <laughs> so you want the outside stakeholders to weigh in on the participation or on the completion? Successful, successful participation. participation. That's what we were. We want him to weigh in on the successful participate, like moving towards successful participation, whatever that looks like. We want them to weigh in on that. Okay, so instead of abolishing completion altogether, I, I really want to hear from them, like what they have to say, because we don't necessarily know that abolishing completion is the way to go. Right. That's just our recommendation. So I was just saying um, to obtain input from outside stakeholders regarding the successful participation process. Okay, I thought it was both no. that we no. we can still no. Okay, well, that's not the amendment I'm making. Okay, okay. the amendment I'm making. Yeah. I don't necessarily know if I agree with using the term part successful participation. There's completion and there's participation. Somebody can, I, I, yeah. I, I don't like the notion that we're going to tell somebody, well, you, you participated for two years, so it's fine. People need goals. And I think that using the term com completion is... Uh, I think where that's coming from is that the completion is more for the court to decide, and then the participation is a more internal program designation. Um, because we really are kind of trying to separate out what what's in the purview of the court. We're, we're trying not to usurp what they're doing by kind of creating these standards that might not agree with what they're doing. So that's where that distinction comes in. I think we can come up with different terms, but that's kind of where it's coming from. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that. They're allowed to have their criteria. We're allowed to have criteria as well. Yeah, so well, what I'm saying is we can come up with different terms for it, but I think it is important to make a distinction between the internal lap criteria and what the court is, is trying that, to do. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the lap portion of it. But we're not replacing one with the other. We're not touching yeah. the successful completion. So that will still exist. We're talking about just adding this oh, participation. Okay. okay. Yeah. So coming back to the motion. Yes. So originally it was uh, to adopt the recommendation number two. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll restate it if you will. Okay. The motion is to add a, uh, to encourage the uh, oversight committee to continue its work to add a process for participants to obtain a determination of having successfully participated uh, that is personalized to the individual with the input from outside stakeholders, especially the state bar court. Is there a second? Second. Oh, I think Martin seconded, but. Yeah, I with second you. that one too. That Can I have two seconds? That would make sense. <laughs> So I have a motion by Jim Piding and a second by Heather Benton and Martin Williams. Um, Michelle, please call the roll. Heather Benton? Yes. Jim Tiding? Yes. Tracy Lesage? Yes. Philip Spiegel? Yes. Martin Williams? Yes. Elise Yenny? Yes. Justin Delacruz? Yes. Excuse me, um, That's Mr. Oh, Chairman. Yes. I believe um, the committee member Nguyen is. Yeah, she joined. She did join. So, um, 
one of the attorneys there. <laughs> it's one of the rules there. Can we include her in the vote or no? So why not? Yeah. Uh, I think we can. She's here now. Yeah. Hi, Deirdre. Hi. Um, she's been here. Have... She's been here for this discussion for the whole for <laughs> whole discussion. May I have yes, I've been joining in. Oh, I I vote yes. Okay. Thank you. So that's a unanimous yes. Great, motion passes. Um, thanks so much to that subcommittee for this really hard work um, and the great discussion. Um, so we're about like an hour and a half in, about another, about another hour, hour and a half scheduled. And I know we have two relatively big um, items left. Are we doing lunch? Yes, there should be delivered already. Um, kind of leave it up to the committee if we want to push through the financial assistance working group report and recommendation we can do that or we can save it till after lunch maybe what about a working lunch yeah do we want to pause to get the food and then we can pause to get the food I, i'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to actually read the report and recommendation maybe we could take like 15 minutes to do that that way we can all have a, a good discussion on it um and uh decide that before we dig into the bigger uh, well, not bigger, but uh, the newer um, item. I'll take those nodding heads. I say yes. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch. I'll we'll see you in like fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. For the record. Twelve forty-five. Twelve forty-five. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. We're still recording. We need to stop the recording. Yes, I'm going to stop the recording. We were going to uh, put a, a screen up as to when we were returning. Oh, okay. We're, we're going to return back at 1245. Yes. I'll pausing the recording. The recording has resumed. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, just finished item 3B, and we are now moving to item 3C. Uh, discussion and possible action on financial assistance working group report and recommendation. And um, I'll turn it over to that subgroup uh, and whoever <clears throat> is going to speak. Uh, Jim Hiding, I'll, I'll start out anyway. Uh, we really didn't have a designated speaker for this, but <clears throat> we were uh, tasked with looking at uh, how to address financial assistance uh, in the future since the statute that uh, has been in existence since the formation of the LAP requires that we uh, make assistance available to uh, participants irrespective of their financial status and, and uh, make sure that we can uh, make available the program to people who couldn't otherwise afford it. So <clears throat> we examined that and uh, as you know that there's been a historical ideal of loaning some money. When we first started out with this back in 2001, two, uh, we talked about grants and that sort of thing, but it was determined that the loan was the way to go. So there's been a evolution of the loan process, but uh, there's historically been a very low re repayment rate and a concern about the cost uh, to ensure that people aren't prevented from obtaining the support they need due to cost. And the, Michelle's summary is a very good summary of, of the decisions and the discussion that took place over the, how many times did we meet? Six times? I think it was six times. We met. Um, and uh, we started out program, or we started out our discussions considering whether they should be grants or whether they should be loans. We, we reviewed bad debts and uh, the ideal of how much it costs to chase them down and how we would chase them down in the future, whether we would seek collection agencies or, or some other way of affecting licensure or uh, paying money. And really the uh, concern was to allow people to get the help that they need and to do it at the, in the most practical and uh, best way for the LAP to do that. So 
And the two most consistent expenses in the LAP are the group fee, which was uh, $250 a month. And then the biological fluid testing fees are somewhere between $90 and $400 per month, depending on the individual and test requirements. Uh, so the, in the current program in 2022, the LAP loaned $23,000 out approximately 23,000 and collected 5,000. Uh, and uh, over the history, according to Michelle's research and putting this together, the LAP currently carries an outstanding debt of about $2 million for loans outstanding. <clears throat> $288,000 has been repaid since the inception of the program. So we uh, went through several ideas as I indicated. We talked about uh, collection agencies and waiving interest on the loans to try to collect uh, and uh, different approaches toward, toward uh, getting people the help that they need. And we came up to, I think, the conclusion that the best approach that we felt going forward would be a grant rather than a loan. Uh, this would have a grant uh, process of a one year it would be a grant of one year uh, for their costs of the program, which would include those the two hundred and fifty dollars of uh, participation group fee per month and the amount necessary for their fluid testing fees, which we thought were the basic requirements <clears throat> for somebody to participate. And that would be all based on an application and uh, based on their household income, not their individual income, uh, but their household income, usually based on State Bar Rule 215 regarding scaling of annual licensing fees, based on poverty levels and uh, other criteria that were listed in your handout. So the uh, this would be 100%, up to 100% program expenses for those group fees and lab testing fees for the one year. You know, in the future, I think we need to consider, we will be considering what happens in the second and third year if they continue on. So the study doesn't end with this, but this certainly our uh, initial, I think, recommendation is that we have a grant made for one year participation probably the first year, but we didn't really designate that, but it would probably be the first year. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, outline includes uh, the criteria of uh, how need would be assessed on page four and uh, would be recommendation is to hand it off, hand off the determination of eligibility to the staff. So that the committee would not have to undertake that uh, on an individual basis uh, based on the criteria that we develop and that we adopt for the staff decision making. Uh, we could have co-pays. We were taught, we talked about co-pays uh, so that uh, to continue to participate uh, if the person was only eligible for 50% uh, contribution, for example, then they would have to come up with $125 to go to the group and they would have to come up with whatever half of their drug testing cost was in order to continue on and uh, continue to be eligible for the grant in the, as the process went forward. So <clears throat> a group estimates the total amount granted to an individual would be a maximum of approximately $7,500 for that year. And uh, that would include a year of the LAP group fees and lab fees at a high testing frequency. And 2022, there were fewer than 10 people approved for a full year of financial assistance. So therefore, based on that number, uh, if there were 10 more people who got this grant, it'd be $75,000 per year. Uh, we considered whether this would actually be cheaper, cheaper in the long run than uh, having loans that were outstanding and that we're trying to chase down. 
we felt that this was the best way to address it is to adopt the grant. So we uh, called it a growth grant. So the recommendations of the, of the working group were to adopt the growth grant, to delegate the administration of the grant to the staff, and then uh, if feasible, uh, especially considering the recent state bars um, legislative opportunity to take our uh, budget and our money, uh, create, if feasible, create an endowment to ensure stable funding year after year as a part of our budget. So that's uh, the recommendation of the group. That's my report. Yes, my, my question is, so we're limiting it to, I think it was 400% or 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, is there any room for people? Because I, uh, you, you noted that the, the bar allows scaling up to 68,000 or something like that, 60,000. Um, is there any room for people who make a little bit more, but due to household expenses that whatever it is cannot afford the payments I, I guess that's you know yes i understand the based on the gross income but i'm just wondering if there shouldn't be like or you know certain percent of your income is allocated towards expenses and you know i'm just wondering if that would help us understand too because i i feel like as someone who has expenses like and doesn't make a ton of money. I I don't know that I could afford this. You know. Well, I'll defer to Michelle, but I on the further consideration. But I think that uh, all of those things would come into be a part of the consideration of the staff in determining whether to grant. But the the ideal is to have a, a set of standards that you can pretty much look to and say based of on the chart, you are eligible or you aren't eligible. To have the subject of consideration in each case would be pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. I also don't think we'd be able to delegate to staff a subjective decision mm -hmm. um, like that. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider that as an approach. Well, I was thinking uh, something more of like you either <clears throat> fit in this chart or your expenses exceed like 60% of your income or something like that. And like very clean, like whatever it looks like. You either fit this or you fit this, and if you, you don't fit either of these, no, you don't get the grant. I'm just trying to account for cost of living. Cost of living. <laughs> and this is well, yeah. California, yeah. where it's very expensive. Another know? issue too is that these these particular uh, fees for testing are not going to stay static. So like everything else, they're going to keep on going up every year. So well, right. the fees will. Not the fees of the collection sites probably go up. Our contract with Vault, they do not, they have not been raising prices every year. Oh, really? They have raised it. They raised it in the beginning of 2002. It was the begin, end of 2002, beginning of this year, um, but they had not raised it in several years. Right. But the frequency should be going down for people because that's something that we can adjust as they are in recovery longer. We'll test sure. people more frequently at the beginning. And if sure. they have established pattern of sobriety, we can reduce the testing. Yeah. So, and the, oh, I'm sorry, was somebody sorry, else? I was just looking, I didn't see anyone. I was wondering, uh, as far as the criteria then for the, for the loan, uh, qualific excuse me, for the grant qualification, uh, I think that the standards can be developed, will be developed, right? I mean, they don't necessarily, uh, they're not defined in this document. Do you agree or that you don't agree? Well, we can change it. I mean, this is what we had defined so far. So I guess that could be a decision of the. This was the easiest approach, you know, that we we found to be the probably the fairest and most uh, equitable at the time, without uh, regenerating a whole new ideal. I, I would agree, especially because when Heather was speaking. I mean, if we get into the expense game, what if somebody has two homes, you know. <laughs> or somebody has a million dollar home, like it's, I don't, I mean, yeah, they might it, ha, spend 70% of their income, but it might be on things that they chose to purchase like a expensive car or something. That's why I think the poverty guidelines that took into consideration as well, other guidelines is, is the fairer, fairest, most subject, 
you know, objective way to go. Otherwise, we get into a game where I don't think, I think when Jim was doing that, I think I was thinking floodgates. <laughs> so anyways, and yeah, we can develop them as he mentioned as well, as we go forward, if we have like, you know, criteria that is clear and isn't open to interpretation. So that's my thought. The, the working group did discuss at some length, the idea of whether somebody's committed to, do we want to evaluate whether they're committed to the sobriety to be earning the grant? Do we want to evaluate whether lots of different subjective things? Do we want to evaluate whether they um, are doing, you know, community service? Are there different things that we could look at and got an opinion from the state bar's general counsel about whether whether even to to start looking at subjective criteria? And it is in the rules that it um, should be just need-based. So it's only based on finances. So that brought the focus back to what are the criteria here? The criteria that we were using are very old. So updating those criteria and making it in a format that could be year by year updated easily based on federal guidelines. And so it's not us, you know, making up something new each year. And, um, and then also then that's where the delegating to staff came in because right now, all the applications go to a smaller working group of committee members to approve. Well, if it's just financial, based on financial need, based on the tax return, where they fall on the chart, why does the committee need to spend their time doing that? Staff can do it. So that's where that recommendation came from. And this is so that it would be written in such a way, because it looks like it's written here, it, it would be written in such a way that it would update every year based on the federal poverty guidelines, right? So, because that's what it looks like here is that we don't actually have to go every year and modify this. We we can literally say it's based on the federal poverty guidelines. Yeah, we can. It, okay. Because we would we would have to update or amend a rule to do this, right? Um, well, that's where Bridget would be the expert on this. Yeah, what does the statute this? say? The statute um, talks about offering financial assistance. It doesn't say how right, it needs it to be say, structured. Right. So that might be related to a state. I don't think it would require, in my reading of the statute anyway, I don't think it would require any kind of amendment to the statute. Right. I think that the statute right. just says that we need to make it available irrespective of financial right. uh, ability. So, so go ahead. So, huh? Pardon? No, I'm saying go ahead. So, I would make a motion that we adopt the recommendation on page five of the <clears throat> outline, which are uh, adopt the growth grant uh, as specified and described in the document, delegate the administration of the grant and its uh, uh, approval as to individuals to the staff, and uh, look to a study whether we can create an endowment in the future. The guidelines for the uh, grant would be specified in the document itself with federal poverty levels uh, to be annually updated. I'll second it. So I have Jim Hiding moving to approve the recommendation on page five. And uh, I've been to second. I do have a question though. Um, in terms of the when we're covering like fifty percent or whatever, um, does does that fifty percent do they pay that to the group person or the facility, or do they pay that back to the state bar so that the state bar is paying the one hundred percent and then they owe fifty percent? How does that work? Uh, the way I conceive it is they pay themselves. They don't pay it back to the state bar. Okay. I think Bridget was going to chime in on the rule issue. I, I was just going to say, I think what we what would make sense is we we can do this by a policy, by the committee adopting a policy. The policy, based on the statute, I believe, needs to be approved by the board as well. So what I was going to suggest is what we can do as staff is take what is prepared in this memo and anything else that is um, if you have any other things based on this discussion that you'd like us to kind of build in and we can take a stab at drafting the pol the formal policy and then having this, the oversight committee can approve it at the next meeting and then we can move from there. Does that make sense to everyone? 
That was good to me. Yeah. So the way it currently works with the funding, do we give like the 7,500 or whatever it is that we will be giving in the loan to the person in its entirety? Or do we actually pay? Because my only question is like working with vendors, are they going to want to be paid from two sources? And so that is something to consider because if they're not going to want to be paid from two sources, then there's going to have to be either the person pays it and gets reimbursed by the state bar or the state bar pays it and the person pays the 50%. So I'm just trying to understand. This um, is similar to the way we do it now in terms of the payment of the money, not in terms of the, you know, whether it's right. a loan or not, but um, but right now it seems to be working. The group facilitators are all perfectly fine with getting half the money. They'll bill us okay. for half of it. They'll bill the participant if it's 50%. Okay. And same thing with the um, with the vault, who's the company okay. we contract with. So that has not been a problem Perfect. yet, actually. And we don't just hand the participants the cash. We right. pay the yeah. directly. <laughs> <laughs> the directly. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Any more discussion on this item? You know, on I do just motion? have to I have one question thinking about us helping to draft this policy as staff is with respect to the one year limitation. Um, is that is I, I don't think I I think we've talked about it a little bit as far as like we'll see what happens in year two or three, but is there a very is there an intent by this group to have it limited to one year or what do you help me articulate that one year situation? <clears throat> I believe the answer is yes, it's limited to one year at this point in time. Um, but do you intend, for, did you talk about that as a subcommittee and do you intend for that to be the case? Because I heard you say something like, we'll see what happens in year two or three, or maybe I, I misheard. Think, I think the financial assistance group would ask that that uh, be subject to further discussion and study as far as years two and three, whether that, whether we could make that available or in what form. Okay. 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 It's we can think about how to draft that into the policy somehow for you to consider at the next meeting. Does that sound yeah, good? Yeah, I, I think it should give give some possibility that an applicant can qualify for more grant money than the first year. So, yeah, I don't okay. know why we limited it. It, it could be because funds are, aren't available. I, I don't know. I mean, we should maybe... Yeah. Like you said, for further discussion, but I mean, I'd be fine with it if it said the applicant can reapply for a second year if they're successful or something. But we didn't actually come to agreement on that. <laughs> Would you want that to be considered by staff or with the, the subgroup? That's a good question. What do you think? Well, what does successful mean? Again. <laughs> I think it should be, the, so I, think, I think, again, uh, the issue is it's going to simply be based upon need because uh, we've been told that we can't we can't talk to group facilitators to find out what somebody's really doing and i think i still i still have a big objection to that whole scenario we're not we're not using any due diligence the the, the statute just says we're supposed to give money and if they meet the financial Criteria. Are you, <clears throat> if I, are you saying that uh, your suggestion is that we make the grant available to years two and three also? Is that what you said? That's what I said. I'm fine with that. Okay. I would be okay with that too, but I, I it, it should be based it should be based upon some some criteria. Well, so if I'm remembering term. correctly, one of the concerns was the cost, right? Because yeah. the group was talking, there was a lot of discussion about how much will this cost us? So let's look at what we paid out in previous years, how much right. we're collecting back. Obviously, we're not collecting back most of the money. Right. And But having it be financial assistance does put a little bit of a damper on it. So we don't know once it becomes a grant, how many additional people will apply and qualify for it. Right, and not only that, but if you if you multiply times three, you figure three years and the same amount of participation at seventy five thousand per year, and now you're multiplying that because uh, you're getting it in the first year, the second year, and the third year, so that's two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. Right, you're committing to rather than seventy five thousand dollars per year. 
uh, in the third year. And people stay longer than three. Yeah. So uh, I'd suggest we limit it to one year at this point in time and study uh, further the additional years. Do we, are we able to track Michelle? I mean, it does concern me that if you, if someone has a need and they, I mean, for what it's worth, someone has a need and they participate in the program for a year, but they don't have, they still don't have the money to continue. Do we have any stats on that? Like what happens to those people? Like, would they drop out or do they find a way or what, or do we know? I don't, I can't think of anywhere we would keep a statistic that connects Hmm. somebody finishing financial assistance with the reason they left the program? Well, perhaps I can take your mind a little bit at ease. I don't think that this uh, approach is to replace the uh, uh, loan process that might be available in subsequent years. It would supplement it. It would be, it would be good for one year, but uh, the, I think that the loan process would still be available at least until we change it for years two and three or however many years. So they would oh. still have financial assistance available. This would be an addition. Oh, you're saying to keep Got it. financial assistance. But we should, be, we should be able to track that if we just look at who gets a grant and whether they continue after, after the first year. And frankly, Bridget, what I'm trying to do by saying that is to buy a little time to study it. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I get it. So you're saying that it, would still, it could still be available, but it wouldn't be a grant. It would. I, I was just looking at the statute as you were talking, Jim, and, and it does say, notwithstanding the goal of providing financial assistance, the amount of funding allocated shall not be allowed to compromise the financial needs of effectively administering the program. So, uh, you know, it's not like it, it's okay to have some kind of limitation as you propose. It's just, and, and the statute is recognizes that. I just wanted you to know. But going forward, we can look at who gets a who gets a grant, and do they drop out after a year or yes, two? We can. Yeah, and I think we, then I, I suggest that we do that because I mean you have a good point. Is yeah. is that affecting somebody's uh, continued right. participation in the program? My guess is we're going to find that it doesn't. But let's, let's we'll, I think we should find out. Or we, I mean, another suggestion would be we could also write in like subject to. Um, you know, they may reapply based on need subject to the financial, um, uh, I don't know, ability of the program to provide it for second and third years or something like that. That would give us the um, the ability to deny it if we thought it was going to threaten the, the overall financial health of the program. I like that. Make that decision, though. Just if somebody reapplies, they automatically get it, or are we going to have some kind of a a process for granting it after the first year. Well, should, one, yeah. sorry, I was going to say one thing we could do would be maintain the, the criteria to be the same, right? As because it is need based. So we would maintain the same criteria. But with respect to second and third years, we could establish some kind of percent floor or something or, or see, I don't know, where we don't want to go below this certain amount of money and grants each year. So the availability of second and third year grants as opposed to loans might be determined based on the, the level of funding that we still have available once we've paid out for the first people in their first year, something like that. So you could still make it an objective criteria, but um, also recognizing Jim's point, like we don't want to open the floodgates and then not be able to pay everybody or let the program run as it needs to be run. We, we can also let, let people know that it's available for a second, third year as a loan, and, uh, but there is a, also a process if they really are having financial difficulty. Right. To get, a, to get another grant. I guess that question, though, raises the question, though, if we make it available as a loan, and as many people don't pay back the loans as we noted in here, and I forget what the number was, it's then isn't it really just a grant anyway? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I, I feel like to after a year, yeah. you might be a little bit, but hopefully after a year, you're a little in a little better <laughs> financial situation. Um, and hopefully you're not thinking that way. And 
I don't think necessarily people are not wanting to pay this back. Like, I think they want to. They just mm -hmm. can't. Um, right. That, right. I mean, that's all I'm saying is, like, if <clears throat> I guess my thing is, if we're going to make it a loan after the first year and we don't get the money back anyway because most people don't pay it back because they can't, whatever reason, um, that's just then a grant anyway. So essentially is what it is in, in not so yeah. clear terms. So I guess my question is, if we're saying one year and then we're saying, okay, it's a loan for the second year, but people don't pay it back, are, is it still costing us the same amount of money as if we just said, we'll give you a grant for years two and three? But you have a certain level of maturity and change in that year that you would hope that the, the uh, repayment uh, success would be greater, I would think. Well, it's not, I don't think it's so much that people don't want to repay, like Justin was saying. I'm just saying they may not be able to. And if we're not going to chase them down, then well, it's not really a lot. Again, I, I think the way to do this is to find out over, over a period of the next five years who gets a grant and then for one year and drops out after one year saying, I just can't afford it. We have, we have to find out what the failure rate is. I don't think it's going to be very, I think it's going to be very low. I think so too. Yeah. I think after a year, people. Yeah. And, and once we have that data, we can make a more intelligent, uh, you know, judgment as to whether we want to extend money to people for the second and third year. I think that's what we need. To do. I think that makes sense. Um, so I guess my question is, when you guys write this policy, you would write it in such a way that the grant is only for the first year and that the remaining criteria would stay in place for second and third year and beyond. Is that what we're saying? No, I don't think so. My understanding is we're revising the criteria period based on the recommendation. We're changing it to a grant as opposed to a loan, at least for the first year. And then we would put something in saying, sec, you know, applicants may apply if you know based on need for a second and third year um and some i'll i'll put maybe we could even put in a couple couple options for you all to consider when we put it back before you at your next meeting but i think what i'm hearing is one option could be they could continue i would suggest using the same criteria but it would be a loan instead of a grant for second and third year a second could be um a grant could would be available pending, you know, dependent upon the the um, amount of available funds from the the program um, for second and third years. Those are the two kind of separate different options. I heard as that's what I was thinking as far as what we would be putting together for you. That's okay with me. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Okay, and those are um, details uh, that maybe the subcommittee could work with staff on in continuance on this particular issue. But we still have a, a motion a second um, on approving the recommendation, which generally aligns with this discussion. So um, is there any more discussion on this, this item? Seeing none, um, Michelle, can you please call the roll? All right, does anybody need a refresher on what you're voting on now? Okay. Don't. Motion number two, uh, Heather Benson. Uh, yes. James Hiding. Yes. Tracy Lesage. Yes. <laughs> Deirdre Wynn. Yes. Philip Spiegel. Yes. Martin Williams. Yes. Elise Yeni. Yes. Justin Delacruz. Yes. All right, that's unanimous. So the motion passes. Um, I want to thank the subcommittee again for the work and continued work on this this item. Um, thanks so much. Okay. So moving to the next item on the agenda, it's item three D. And this is uh, introduction and discussion of the recommendations from the ad hoc commission on the discipline system regarding the alternative discipline program. And this item is being presented by Bridget Graham. Thank you. So I, I put in this memo and uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read it, but 
basically, um, the board had established this ad hoc commission on the discipline system back in uh, 2020, I think, to look at a, a range of issues regarding our discipline system and how to make it more equitable. And one of the many recommendations the commission made was to revisit um, particular, particularly this moral turpitude requirement for the ADP program. And um, the concern, the, the kind of more narrow concern that the, that the ad hoc commission had was that, you know, preventing, basically what that means is you can't, you're not eligible to participate in the program and ADP if you have been, I guess, accused of something that involves moral turpitude. Um, that has, the, the, the point of the ad hoc commission, or at least the concern that they raised in their report had to do with the fact that the parties, the respondents are not really given an opportunity to challenge like in, in a hearing of any kind, whether or not you know, the, the characterization of their wrongdoing as moral turpitude or not. And so the proposal was just for somebody to look more into that particular requirement, this moral turpitude um, as it related to the kind of a due pro more of a due process argument really about whether or not there should be a separate whole hearing process to determine whether or not this was moral turpitude. So staff um, was assigned to look into this more last year. And as I was looking into this with Michelle and Melanie, uh, we talked to some stakeholders, we talked to the court, we talked to the chief trial counsel's office and did some research on our own to just kind of figure out where did this moral turpitude requirement come in to begin with. And um, based on that research and all the conversations that we had, what staff ended up recommend, recommending is really just uh, an over a, a real look at this whole program in general. It hasn't really changed since it was initially adopted back in 2002, I believe. There are a few substantial changes, maybe a couple years later, but it, it really could use a comprehensive review of their existing procedures. I know earlier we were talking about um, collaborative courts or care courts. I know Heather re referenced hair, care courts. Um, somebody else was talking about drug courts. We, I've heard the term collaborative court. That is something that we are really interested in looking at as a potential model. We, we'd already been looking at collaborative court as a recommendation as part of our, um, our probation redesign model. And, and that's something that has been of interest to, to people at the state bar I know. And so, what we recommend, we, we staff recommend to the board was that, um, that a comprehensive overview be undertaken and the board recommendation or a directive was that this committee would be the best group to take on that role because of all of your expertise in this specific field. Even though the state bar court is the, actually operates the ADP, everybody that's in it is also part of LEP. And so given your expertise, um, I think I, I think it's going to be really positive and it's going to be great to get all of your input on this particular thing. I raised the moral turpitude because um, in my in my looking back at the history of it, it was really interesting that originally and Jim, maybe you you might have remembered or some of you that have been around since the beginning, but it seems like it was kind of open to anybody at first. And then there were so many participants, people were concerned and the Supreme Court expressed some concern that um, too many people were kind of escaping, with, so, to, so to speak, the formal disciplinary process. And they were worried that it was too big. And so they, they decided to add this moral turpitude requirement, which really took it, um, narrowed down who was actually able to take advan advantage of the program. And that hasn't really been revisited since. Um, and my understanding is it's kind of caused some questions about from the, from the court standpoint and um, it's just caused some confusion, I think, about what really that term means. And, and myself, I'm asking the question, is that really the right, the right line in the sand to be drawing anyway about who should or should not take, um, be able to take advantage of this program? I don't know the answer to that, but I just think enough time has passed that it really makes sense to take a look at where we are, you know, what models are out there, whether our existing criteria make sense or not, and then make recommendations to the board about that in November. So that's my long speech about kind of where we are and what the ask of is of this committee. And what I thought would be helpful today would be really just kind of like we did last year at this meeting, 
plan out, okay, how are we going to tackle that during this year? Um, maybe, you, and I'm really open to however, I'm happy to guide it, or if you all might have your own thoughts, but I was thinking similar to how you've done with this year with the working groups. I think that worked out really well. Um, maybe we could identify a couple discrete working groups. I mean, one thing specifically that's been requested of this group is to get that stakeholder feedback we've been discussing earlier. That includes state um, state bar court, obviously, and, and understanding you know, their concerns with the program. Um, Respondents Council, ADDC would be a good one. Uh, you know, maybe we could even, I could think about how, how we do this from a confidentiality standpoint, but if there are former LAP participants that we'd be able to talk to a former ADP participants or just trying to understand, um, you know, how we might make this program more modern if if needed and better if needed, but just at least taking a review to see what, what we think. So I'll open it up to see what you all, if you have thoughts or ideas about how we might structure it and go from there. But well, we have to come back in November to the board. Uh, Jim Hiding, I, I think it's a great that we would be participating in such a central role to conduct a comprehensive review of the program. You know, they, historically, it wasn't that there were too many people in the program that, that caused it to be uh, shrunken down. It was that there were, there were fears that people were scamming the program, that they were uh, that they were saying that they were addicted to alcohol or drugs, uh, and that's the reason I stole from my trust account. Uh, and they were trying to get into the alternative discipline program and avoid the consequences of their actions. And so that was the real fear, and that's why everything got reduced and kind of focused in and changed. It wasn't just numbers. Uh, and so I think it's really good that we would be tasked to do that. I think this is the central group that should be doing it, and I encourage it. I encourage us to adopt that and move forward with it. I had some thoughts on. Uh, Thank you, Jim. Um, tackling this. <laughs> right. I, I, immediately in my mind, I agree. Like I think working groups should be assigned to this. I don't think it should be one because I think it would be too much more work for that group. Um, to do. So I was hoping if people agree with that approach, taking aside that, you know, people are going to do volunteer. Um, maybe we could identify specific concepts and topics to assign to each group um, and use that, you know, the next 30 minutes to do that. Um, that might be a really good use of our time. But having only kind of briefly reviewed I, I mean, I really don't have a handle on the rules of procedure or the AD pro, ADP program itself. You know, if staff can help, you know, maybe a group, you know, we maybe we could go rule by rule, but that might not make sense. But maybe there's mm -hmm. concept by concept or procedures, or we could have a group that's set at looking at this moral turpitude issue. Although it kind of, what I'm hearing is that we kind of have a decision on that, or at least some people have strong thoughts on that. Um, we could have a group assigned to doing outreach for stakeholders and doing that early on. Um, you know, maybe it's way too early to assign working groups and we literally just say for the next four months, let's go uh, do outreach to stakeholders and find out what where the concerns are. Maybe that's a good way of uh, raising issues. Um, those are just kind of the thoughts that are going on in my mind. And now that, you know, looking at the 30 minutes that we have left, uh, you know, um, trying to make best use of what time we have left. I mean, I kind of felt like, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead, Heather. Um, I kind of, so one of the things I noticed is that this one has a term of participation and program, which kind of goes to what we're talking about, about benchmarks, because this one is a minimum of, it's 36 months with a minimum of 18. Mm -hmm. So that would go to the whole benchmarks and successful benchmarks. I think um, I also see this like eligibility requirements as a piece. Like what is required, and that goes to the moral servitude issue. Um, so there's like a whole eligibility section, 381 at 5.381 and 5.382 is acceptance and eligibility. And then I see the actual process of, of so I'm saying like 
eligibility process and then um like yeah that's kind of the two i see and and then i think that you know that then some of this goes back to successful participation successful completion um and then you know i think that there should be some conversation about the criteria the judges are looking for mm -hmm. when they um like not specifically for each case but like what the judge needs to consider when they're weighing whether a person can be you know completed the program or not um so i just those are kind of like the three things i like the three big things i see I do think there's quite a bit of overlap in, in terms of what we're yeah. working on with the benchmarks. And I'm happy to like hold a piece of that in, but I don't know that that we can tackle all of it. But it, it does, I, I like Justin's idea too of, of kind of waiting until we get some input from the stakeholders instead of trying to define the issues ourselves and then find out later that we haven't hit the mark of what they're wanting. Is that, oh. Can I ask the state bar representatives who, uh, do we have that time? I mean, I agree with that approach too, Justin, yeah. but do we have that time? This this ADP has been being studied and developed now for about two years at least, right? And so I don't know what kind of time constraints or focus the board would have. We have to make recommendations September 23rd, 2023. 2024. No, November 2024. Oh, just a year ready from now. To be yeah. Ready for yeah. the November board meeting. Yeah. So could we so, could we so. find out about these issues? Uh, reaching out to stakeholders and then have a, another sure, meeting. Right. We could have a Zoom meeting, say in February. Yes, okay. I like that idea too. For what it's worth, I maybe what maybe um what you could do would be set up some working uh -huh. groups for this interim time that would maybe divide up the stakeholders or uh, so you could maybe spend a few minutes talking about who you want to talk to and then assign maybe two people each to interview the stakeholders from their particular group report back to the main you know the oversight committee at yes maybe then at the next meeting and then from there you can establish subject matter working groups to to take on the feedback that you've heard that should give you plenty of time i think if you you know, over the summer to kind of finalize the recommendations or research and finalize the recommendations before the board meeting. Can, can you define for me who the stakeholders are? So that State Bar Court, mm -hmm. Respondents Council, former ADP participants, OCTC? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think lab staff yeah. too would have some good insight, you know, based on the people that they've seen. Perhaps nice. I don't know. But. Can we assign lab staff to uh, interview themselves? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring our own yes. perspective. Can you repeat what you said? This oh. was, the suggestions are right on the last page three of Bridget's memo, oh. where it says oversight committee assignment in bold. One sentence down oh. from there. There you go. Suggest State Bar Court, Office of Chief Trial Counsel, Association of Discipline Defense Counsel is the Respondents Council, LAP staff, and the Oversight Committee. And then we wanted to add former participants, potentially former participants, if we identify any who are willing to be um, public, I suppose. Like, former participants. participants. Um, this memo here that's from, that's from Bridget. That was summarizing who we spoke to um, right here in preparation for the board making the recommendation to the board, but I think it is a similar group and I think it would be great. Um, and I definitely defer to you all and Michelle, particularly about whether it's appropriate to interview former participants. Yes. Right under that. I think it would, would be good. Would you guys be able to like arrange for us to have those meetings with with people? So that we're not just sort of randomly reaching out to people and they're like, who are you and why are you, you know, it's like, we're from LAPOC. Well, nobody told me LAPOC was going to call, you know, sure. so just Absolutely. maybe if you guys can coordinate those meetings and then we can, you know, participate in a hearing at them. Mm -hmm. Yep. I 
think in addition to the stakeholders, maybe, um, you know, like we talked about and Bridget mentioned, we need to look at what the collaborative courts and other courts are doing too mm -hmm. in preparation for that February meeting so that we can have that conversation and then kind of jump in from there. Yes, I was gonna say the same thing. So looking at this list, there's five separate groups. Two of them are LAP. So um, I'm hoping staff can um, handle the LAP stakeholders on this list. So that would leave three out, outside stakeholders that need to be reached out to. So that in my mind would mean three sub or three working groups or subcommittees uh, assigned to one assigned to each. What is our maximum number of um, members that could be part of a subcommittee? Is that three? Uh, I think two is probably safer, right? Safer. Do you, Erica, go ahead. Yeah, it, it would be three because that's less than a quorum, but you, you'll you never be able to communicate the information. If, if, if the chair is not involved, you'll never be able to communicate to the chair what is going on, uh, essentially, um, okay. if, if it's three. And, and, it. and Justin, you're not a part of it. I'm not going to be on every group, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to put that out there. I will be part of a group, but not everyone. Um, okay, so let's for now assign two people to... Um, two members to each of these one first three subcommittees and then do we want to do one that's starting to look at collaborative courts or do we want to save that for the next approach for the next meeting i think we should look at it now just to so that we have all the information for the next meeting and then when we decide on the working group we have a better sense the working groups can kind of jump in without having to do more research. Got it. Okay. Um, do you, we... seem, you seem uh, passionate about that particular I subject. I okay. would happy to take that on. Cool. Um, my thought is, should we have a consistent list of questions that we want to start the conversation with so that everybody's asking the same thing? And then if it kind of veers off, great. Um, but we all, so we all come back with the same criteria. I like that idea too. Yeah. Um, you have ideas about what the question should be that we could, maybe we could yeah. give some ideas to staff and then, yeah. um, I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, where do you, what are the areas that you see that are challenges in the current program and, um, what recommendations do you have for changes or improvements? What's working? Um, you know. What is your role and how does it fit into the big picture? Uh, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Do you, I think it was great. Do you want to include one? I, I think we, I think the director from the board is broad enough that you don't have to focus in on this moral turpitude eligibility specifically, but might it be worth asking, you know, in this initial round of, of, inquiries, their specific feelings about this moral turpitude um, requirement one way or the other? I think that's great. Okay. Can ask them in a leading way too? Of course, always. <laughs> we shouldn't have moral turpitude, should we? <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I really don't know the answer to it, but I am curious about what, you know, how it's played out and what you know, I just in my own talking to some people about it, it's it's interesting how it has I've at a minimum I know it's led to confusion. I don't know beyond that what but how we might be able to fix that is it it would be interesting to know. Okay. So um do I have two um well since we already have Heather with collaborative courses, there someone else who would like to work on that particular issue early on? Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, who would like to uh, reach out to the state bar court? I'll start naming names. <laughs> I, I, don't... I already I'll, I'll have put... a section too that I'd like to do. That's which wasn't that. So, so I didn't. Oh, follow. okay. Tracy, where do you want to go? I'd like to do respondents council. Can Can we lump in um, potentially seeking uh, 
former ADP participants in that group too? Because I feel like that would be a um, yeah, because they might that'd be a, a logical yeah. extension, right? I agree. Okay. Who would like to join Tracy in reaching out to Respondents Council? Respondents Council, I'll do that. Yep. Okay. Um, who would like to reach out to the State Bar Court in addition to me? I'll, I'll work on that. Okay. And then who would like to reach out to uh, OCTC? Uh, I'll be happy to do that too, since Respondents Council is on one side and OCTC would be the other side of the coin. So and I can do that with James. Okay. And then, uh, and now we just need one more person to help out Heather with collaborative courts. I can do that one. Okay, so for those four pots, we have uh, Justin and Philip with the uh, reaching out to state bar courts, uh, Tracy and Jim reaching out to respondents council and ADP, Jim and Heather reaching out. And oh, and and respondents council, um, Jim and Heather reaching out to OCTC, and then Heather and Elise uh, starting a overview of collaborative court models, which you guys already. Do that kind of as part of your I don't think work? we completely really? did okay. it. No, but, I think we talked about it, but we haven't got quite gotten there. Okay. So, um, okay. So we got that part off. When do we want to start reaching out, setting meetings, um, and say, coming back and talking to each other about what we found? I would um, say if we can reach out now to set meetings after the first of the year. That'll be good. I don't think anybody's going to want to meet before the first of the year mm -hmm. with the holiday coming up. But if we can at least set the meetings for like the first two or three weeks in January, that seems like it would be appropriate. And staff can facilitate the introduction to those um, groups for you all. But we can reach out to you after. That'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very helpful. Um, and then. I think will staff also be formulating the questions that we've kind of suggested. We can get yeah. those early on. And should we provide those to our interviewees ahead of time so that they're prepared? Um, I feel like not necessarily to elicit a written response, but to, you know, At least let begin people the dialogue. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah they can organize prepared. their thoughts. Yeah, they, yeah. Um, I agree. I, I think that would be a great idea. With who, the, who would be putting that together in the staff? In other words, uh, the reason I ask that is uh, so that we can have input to you as to what we think might be some areas of concern that we'd like to have you include. I can be the contact. I can be the yeah. contact for that. I mean, I know we'll be in contact about it for um, for setting these up. But if you have things you want to give to me, like additional questions you think of that you want to ask the stakeholders email them to me and then I can okay. include them in the list. And then I, you know, communication with staff, you can have freely, just not with each other. So if you have questions or things come up, you can email or call me. And then if I need to send an email to, you know, to the working group, to the two of you, then we can do that. And I can send the list of questions to everybody. And when I send e e emails to you, they will all be BCC'd. So you don't accidentally respond to reply all and then get into a, a violation because you're meeting. in a serial meeting with each other or a, yeah, just an unnoticed meeting. So, but, working um, group but I can there. provide you with information. Working you group, people. the two of you can talk to each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can send information to all of you as the group to receive, but you can't talk about it with each other all as a group. And then you can talk to me and ask me things. But the working group to. can talk to each other. But the two people in each group pair can talk to each other about that. Right. Group. Right. Yeah. They may work together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bridget, is, is there anything else sounds you great. want to cover on this? No, I think that sounds great. And I think that kind of segues into um, just planning for planning mm -hmm. purposes for next year. If Michelle, if you want to talk about that, we can talk about like the next <clears throat> recite committee meetings. And I think as far as ADP goes, this, this project, I think 
taking until the next meeting to conduct your stakeholder interviews and kind of compile what you've learned and then we can share it at the at the next kind of quarterly meeting that makes sense and then we can go from there so michelle i'll let you do the scheduling discussion <laughs> right. well there. the question was if we were meeting quarterly this um this past year we had scheduled the meetings in you know, january or sometime at the beginning of the year for each quarter of this year um the year before that, I think the way we did it was sending out a poll to everybody because we were adding more meetings in during the year. And so we wanted to meet more frequently and just kind of send a poll saying you all available next month at whatever time. So um, for this, now that we have a new project, maybe we do want to meet as a full group more than four times a year. So we can do, we can probably do either way or a combination, like schedule four meetings quarterly um, and then add additional if we need it. Um, so my recommendation would be at least the first, the next, the next meeting should be in February. Yeah. Um, so that we can at least outline and maybe from there, we can figure out where the rest of the meetings can yeah. be or mm -hmm. need to be. Um, I think we do, are we required to meet quarterly or let's just say, mm -hmm. does it say we meet quarterly? I don't remember. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't think it's required. I don't think there's a schedule. I don't think it's required. Yeah. Would it? Would it be okay for us to just decide, let's meet, you know, whenever we're available in February, and then kind of based on the discussion there, plan out the rest of the year, because then we'll have an idea of the scope yeah. of what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Then we can decide if we want more than four more mm -hmm. or three more. Um, we can just kind of decide from there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we've been, we've been doing, um, the meetings virtually, of course, because as you all, as we talked about the state bar's financial issues, we're trying to be very conservative with money and not um, having in-person meetings more than one time a year. So we can we can have a similar plan. We'll plan the virtual meetings for most of the year. And then um, at the end of the year, or perhaps second to the last one of the year, when we're finalizing our recommendations, we can do an in-person meeting. So we'll probably want to have an October meeting, right? Is that a good enough time for you to finalize materials for the November? So this is, Bridget needs to go to the November board meeting, which means the materials need to be done like a month in advance, right? Yeah, maybe so, early October should work, I think, for a final finalization. Yeah. Um, Why don't we do late September then? So let's at least look for a date in February and, and a, then a, late, a date in late September for in person for for an in person to kind of wrap up this project mm -hmm. and um it had seemed like february sorry, fridays around the lunchtime hour has been what's worked for people yeah. so we'll focus on that not yet. Yes. not that the world were revolves yeah. around here it totally does, does. <laughs> It revolves around me too. How do you spell narcissist? Well, <laughs> this is that. Um, right. Look at your calendars now for February, or did you want to do that offline? Is it easier to do a doodle to do this? Oh, it might. Well, well, only... I've seen it work pretty well or everyone just to sit in here right this minute and you look at your calendars, but at least for February, that might work. I don't know. Might be worth There's it. only so many Fridays in February, so yeah. Yeah. you can just take a look at yeah. Um If we know we're looking at a Friday, we probably don't want to do the first one if these groups are getting together in January. So that leaves us the 9th, 16th, and 23rd. I think the 16th would be good. That's just my opinion. The ninth is not good for me. I have a meeting all day on two nine. You can get out of it if you come to ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, the funny thing is it's a standing head of court meeting, which I actually had today. Oh. And I barely made it here by 11. <laughs> so, so I don't want to miss. It's, it's, it's a meeting that's not really missable by me. Yeah. Some the other 16th? like that. As as very much just kidding, but yeah. But so, yeah that, that, I, how's the sixteenth look for people? Works for me. I have some testimony I have to take on the sixteenth that's scheduled. Okay. Uh, twenty third. Twenty third. Twenty third is good. Twenty third. 
23. Yep, that's open for me too. All right, lock it in. All right, Deirdre's nodding yes. Elise? Yes. yes. Bill, you think yes? yes. All right, I'll so that's okay. So that is Friday, February 23rd. And we'll plan it 12 to 2. All right. Like we've been doing. There we go. And this one is Zoom? And it'll be Zoom, yes. Uh, should we just send out a doodle for September? Or? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I guess. At it the next meeting. Yeah, okay. I do have one uh, thing I want to say, and I, I want to say that we really appreciate the staff's uh, hard work and and preparing for this meeting, especially and preparing for those subgroups that we've been involved with over the course of the last few months. Really, it's been very very helpful, and and you've listened very carefully and put together things that we thought should be put together and in the way we thought they should be put together. So thank you very much. Welcome. Mm -hmm. I'd echo that thank you. Mm -hmm. Not just for this year, but the previous year thank as well. <laughs> yeah. It's excellent I work. Really we've been it. we've been kind of going like, well, I feel like we've been going like hundred miles an hour, so it must feel like you're going a million miles an hour. <laughs> um and it's great. I was talking about momentum last year and it feels like we carried that. Mm -hmm. So um it's great to everybody here. So thank you. Um I think that's it's clear. Yeah. So I will adjourn the meeting. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. Having the recording. Thank you.